I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my professional responsibility class about a recent ABA formal ethics opinion, number 505, that came out in May of 2023, and it's about advance fees for contemplated services. What we're really talking about here are what lawyers often call something like a non-refundable uh, retainer or non-refundable uh, engagement deposit or something like that, some sort of advance fee that they plan on keeping whether or not the client continues with the representation. Now, the ABA has taken come out and taken a strong stance that uh, such non-refundable retainers are impermissible under the model rules, and that's what you should know. Uh, this was a little controversial because some states, in fact, allow it. So when you're in practice, you should definitely check what the rules are in your state. But for purposes of the MPRE for that test or for the exams in my course, you should follow the rule that's set forth in this opinion because that's what the MPRE will be assuming. And it's also what's really implied by uh, the model rules, the language of the model rules. So having said that, let's dive in. So the big takeaway is, and to quote the opinion, an advance fee paid by a client to a lawyer for legal services to be provided in the future cannot be non-refundable. In other words, in practice, normally there's no such thing as a prepaid legal fee that is truly non-refundable to the client if the lawyer does no subsequent legal work to earn that fee. If you earn the fee, you can keep it. But if a client prepays some fees and then that fires you the next day or decides not to proceed with the representation, you don't get to keep the fees. And that's the sort of the bottom line here. Now, this opinion ties together the three big rules about legal fees in the model rules. And that's something that makes it useful for students in kind of reviewing and uh, uh, ratcheting up your understanding of how the rules connect. So the main rule about uh, legal fees is rule 1.5. And then you may remember that 1.16D is a provision about returning unearned or unused fees that were paid in advance to a client upon termination of representation. And then there's a rule I cover at the end of my course, 1.15, that's about handling client fees that have been prepaid. Basically, they have to be put in a special client trust account. So the opinion starts with rule 1.5 and reminds us that under that rule, all fees must be reasonable and unearned fees must be returned to the client. Therefore, it's not accurate to label a fee non-refundable before it has actually been earned and labels do not dictate whether a fee has been earned. So if you're being paid for, for not doing anything, that's not a reasonable fee. And it then moves on to Model Rule 1.16d, which requires that upon termination of the representation, a lawyer shall refund any advance payment of fee or expense that has not been earned or incurred. As I mentioned, under Rule 1.15, fees paid up front must be deposited in a client trust account. And this is going to matter in our next section here. Um, and lawyers can't bypass this requirement merely by labeling some upfront fees as a retainer or non-refundable. So this is going to apply whether we're talking about prepaid flat fees. So let's say you agreed to handle a certain sort of discrete matter for a client for $10,000 or $15,000 total from beginning to end, and you ask for the money up front. That's fine, but you have to put that in a client trust account. You don't get to commingle it with your own funds or your firm's operating funds. And the same is true if you ask for uh, sort of a prepayment for towards your hourly fees that you're going to draw against as you do work on the case. That has to go in a client trust account. You cannot commingle it with your own funds or your firm's operating expenses. Now, in the legal profession, there's a lot of different terminology and jargon for these sort of prepaid fees. And the opinion notes that some lawyers call it an advance fee, some call it a fee advance. Some people talk about special retainers, others to call it a security retainer, and others just call it a prepaid fee. 
Uh, whatever term you use or your firm uses, such labels cannot change the lawyer's ethical duties under the model rules. In other words, you can't make 1.16D or 1.15 uh, um, inapplicable just by calling it something else. And let's talk about this word retainer. You would be better off while you're in law school and until you have completed the MPRE, just not even using the word. So the opinion says sort of bluntly, neither the term retainer nor retainer fee is found really anywhere in the model rules of professional conduct. Regrettably, Many lawyers use the term loosely to mean any sum of money paid to the lawyer at or near the commencement of the representation. And I, when I was in practice, heard lawyers use this all the time. They would talk about the client has to give me a $5,000 retainer or a $7,000 retainer just to agree to undertake the representation, almost like a signing bonus for the lawyer. Or they would talk about their any money the client paid up front towards their hourly fees as the retainer amount. Nowhere in the model rules do they use the word retainer. And you won't see it on the MPRE unless it's a question about a lawyer doing something wrong and trying to get around the rules by calling something a retainer. So it's not a a term that has significance or real meaning in the model rules. Now, historically, there was a time in our legal system when we used the term general retainer or retainer for something that the client did pay before the representation began, basically to keep the lawyer available uh, for representation or maybe to secure the exclusive services of that lawyer so the lawyer wouldn't represent other clients. And the opinion talks about this. It was a term of art and it distinguishes it from most of what lawyers are doing today and calling retainers. So let's go back to our slides. In the old days, we had something we called a general retainer. And so a true retainer or general retainer was something that was paid and deemed earned upon the promise of availability to represent a client, whether or not the services are actually needed or requested by the client. In other words, it's like reserving your right to have the lawyer on call as needed. Sometimes a, a firm in, let's say, say 100 years ago or 150 years ago, um, you wanted to ensure that they didn't get involved in the matter representing other parties. So you would kind of reserve your right to use them if you wanted to in a specific matter, or you had some upcoming legal matters on the horizon and you wanted the, to make sure that this firm would be available to represent you. And so you would pay them to sort of be on call for you. Sometimes the these types of general retainers were exclusive, right? The firm would agree to represent essentially only your company or only you as a uh, political figure or elected official or celebrity or something like that. In other words, the opinion says, uh, hourly time is not billed against a general retainer, if we're talking about true general retainers, and a general retainer is not a flat fee for a specific amount of the lawyer's time. It is solely to reserve the lawyer's availability. And note that such a general retainer would not be placed in a client trust account because it is deemed earned on the date of such a contract, because it's a promise to keep yourself available and basically respond promptly when the client calls on you. That means it's not accurate at the same time to call this non-refundable. So these sort of archaic general retainers could in fact be unreasonable. In other words, too high or exploitative, or if you were being paid and then you were going to do anything, or um, you had no intention of providing representation to the client, that would be unreasonable. And it would be unearned if the lawyer does not make herself available as needed. So true general retainers are very rare, maybe non-existent in the mo in modern legal practice. 
And so the opinion gives a couple of quick examples. Let's say a corporation or corporate client pays a lawyer to be available for an expected corporate merger. So they see a merger or acquisition on the horizon. There's been um, preliminary talks about it. And there's a certain lawyer they want to make sure is available who really knows the area, is, has a reputation for mergers and acquisitions. But then when the time comes and they ask the lawyer to do some work, the lawyer says, sorry, I'm too busy with other clients, or, oh, I'm sorry, in the meantime, a conflict of interest has arisen or something like that. Well, in that case, you're not fulfilling your end of the bargain, right? The client paid you basically to be available whenever they needed you within a certain time frame. There's other circumstances that would require a refund, even for one of these old-fashioned true general retainers, like the death or disability or suspension or disbarment of the lawyer. So if someone paid you to be available to handle their case and then you got disbarred, well, even though you had taken that money and you could treat it as your own because it was money in exchange for a promise that the other person could then rely on. Um, if you are not going to be able to fulfill that because you're no longer allowed to practice law, then you actually have to return that money. Let's take a look at the three hypothetical scenarios that the ABA included in this opinion, which would be very tempting to turn into multiple choice questions. So a formal opinion 505 gives three hypothetical scenarios at near the end of the opinion that are useful to discuss for students because they're so likely to appear as multiple choice questions either on the MPRE or a law school exam. And the second one is really just a variation on the facts of the first, a minor variation. So let's talk about this scenario. A divorce lawyer charges a new client what he calls a non-refundable retainer of $6,000 to cover the initial drafting and filing of the divorce complaint and any other preliminary motions or hearings that occur or negotiations. The lawyer then says that more installments will be due after the lawyer has worked 20 hours on the matter to cover the lawyer's $300 an hour fee. The client then signs this written retainer agreement. Three weeks later, the client informs the lawyer that she has reconciled with her um, husband and does not want to proceed with the divorce and wants a refund of any unearned fees. And by that point, the lawyer had started working on the case but hadn't gotten very far. So the lawyer had done five and a half hours of work um, drafting the complaint and had filed it and had paid out of his own pocket the court filing fee of $150. But the lawyer argues with the client that the $6,000 that she paid up front was non-refundable. After all, it was put in writing and she signed the document. Well, some states would allow this, but the ABA, in this opinion, takes a strong stance that the lawyer owes the client a refund. He, the, client, the lawyer is not allowed to keep the whole 6000 even though the lawyer told the client it was not non-refundable. So the $6,000 paid by the client to the lawyer are fees paid in advance, not uh, what we used to call a general retainer. And under this agreement, the lawyer is rendering legal services at the rate of $300 per hour. So if the lawyer's worked five and a half hours, the lawyer has earned only $1,650 in legal fees and is entitled to reimbursement for the $150 a lawyer spent on court filing costs. So if you add those two together, the lawyer gets to keep $1,800 out of the $6,000. And that means the lawyer has to return $4,200 to the client and failure to return the balance of $4,200 is a violation of Model Rule 1.16d which says that upon termination of representation, a lawyer shall refund any advance payment of fee or expense that has not been earned or incurred. The same is true, this is the second hypothetical they give, where the only change is that the lawyer calls it a non-refundable engagement fee, which is, quote, deemed earned upon receipt by the lawyer. 
that doesn't change anything, right? So they say, you assume all the same facts, but now the lawyer calls it this. As the opinion notes, there are no magic words that a lawyer can use to change what is actually an advance payment for fees into a general retainer. So the terminology that you use in your agreement with the client doesn't matter and doesn't get you out of obeying the um, uh, rules that control legal fees and how the fees have to be handled. Hypothetical three is about a flat fee. Um, so a criminal defense lawyer charges an upfront flat fee of, in the opinion, it's $15,000 that he calls non-refundable and says the fee was earned when paid. Now, suppose such a lawyer did some preliminary work on the case, but long before trial, the defendant uh, decided to fire the lawyer and either hire someone else or um, proceed pro se. Well, it doesn't matter that this was a flat fee and that the lawyer said it was non-refundable. The lawyer has to prorate basically whatever um, work he's actually done on the case and has to return any fees not yet earned by doing actual legal work. When a client pays an advance to a lawyer, the lawyer takes possession but not ownership of the funds to secure payment for the services the lawyer will render to the client in the future. In other words, the funds have to be put in a client trust account, and if it's a flat fee, then when you complete the work that you agreed to do, you can take the funds. Um, or if it's towards if it's an hourly basis representation, then periodically, as you have worked and earned the funds, you can draw it down from the funds that are in the client trust account. But if the matter resolves quickly, or the client fires you, or you suddenly realize that you have to withdraw, or let's say a court disqualifies you from the case, you have to return um, whatever fees you haven't actually earned yet by doing legal work. And that concludes our discussion of ABA Formal Ethics Opinion 505 from May 2023 about fees paid in advance for contemplated services.